Thank you for joining us at worship here today. Here are this week's announcements. Our Sprouts Preschool Ministry reopened today, and our Rooted Kids Ministry will reopen on February 7th. If you are interested in becoming part of our prayer chain, please email Donna Kugel. Just a reminder that our adult choir does start back on January 24th at 4.30 p.m. Now is a great time to join choir if you're interested. That concludes our announcements for today. If you want to go ahead and grab your Bible and open up to Luke, Pastor is going to continue his series on Waymaker. So, let's, let's go, go to, to church! church. Good morning. Great to see all of you with us in worship today. We are especially glad to have you if you are a guest today, whether in person or online. We had a good group in the first service. I think the snow might have scared a few people away in this service, but I'm glad that you're here in person or if you're watching online. Thank you so very much for joining us today. You may have noticed from that video we began with that today is Sanctity of Life Sunday. So we pray for the unborn and we pray that God would help people to make life decisions. You know, I think about adoption in the middle of this. I, I see uh, the big Neils and Santiago here and, and God using so many of you to impact people with the love and the truth of Jesus Christ. I see this precious baby in the back corner here and the opportunity to celebrate with them. And we're going to do a ch dedication sometime soon. So excited about all those things. And I'm excited about seeing you here today. Well, Paul Self, our worship minister, is out of town today, but we have the amazing Andrew McIntosh leading us in worship today. On the count of three, everybody say hello, Andrew. One, two, three. Hello, All right, that was pretty good. Let's pray, then we'll get started. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy and love. Bless Paul as he's away, and thank you for his leadership here with our worship. Thank you for Andrew being here today. I pray that you would empower him 
and you would sing through him and through us to lift up the name of Jesus. Help me as later on I preach. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Glorify your name. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up and sing together. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, sing, O oh, earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory, strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children in his arms he carries them all day long praise him praise him tell of his excellent greatness praise him praise him ever in joyful song praise him praise him jesus our blessed Suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Praise Him. Him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Amen. Well, good morning, Northside family. We're so glad you're here. Uh, if you're here in person or whether you're joining us in our online campus, we're uh, glad to have you with us, and I am especially excited to be here. Obviously, I'm not Paul. Paul is much more handsome than I am, but I am so honored to be here. But I'm even more honored to be able to sing praises to such a wonderful and awesome God. We have the opportunity, nay, the privilege to worship an amazing God. Uh, and, and that is just exciting to me. So let's continue to do so. Let's worship an awesome God. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. We long to you. Hope is stirring. Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Come every way among us. 
when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. I come and I confess bowing here I find my rest without you I fall apart you're the one that guides my
my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord anything or anyone else in this world. Well, we come to our time of offering, and you know the routine. There's lots of different ways that you can give. You can give by bank draft, in person, by mail, online giving, all kinds of ways that you can do that. Give generously as God leads. You may know the first Sunday this year we're not able to meet in person, so we're a little bit behind. So if you can help out, that would be great. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your grace and mercy, your love, your compassion. Thank you for the opportunity now to, uh, in just a few moments, look at your word. I thank you for all that you do. I pray that you'd move in our lives and move in this worship today. We need you more than we need anything or anyone. Bless these offerings, Lord, as we drop it off with the box out in the foyer or as we give by bank draft or online or send it in the mail, however we do it. Lord, bless these gifts and use it for your glory. And I pray that you would speak to us continually through music and through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name and the people of God said together, amen.
tears now I'll Amen. Thank you, Andrew and worship band for leading us in worship today. It's great to see you. If you are a guest today, we would love to find out more about you. Shoot us a text at 270-300-3078. We'd love to give you a gift as a way of saying thank you for being with us today. Let's pray together. Father, glorify your name as we look at your word. Hear our prayer. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Question. How many of you have ever been tempted? Probably all of us could have raised our hands. Temptation happens to everybody, the young, the old, the rich, the poor. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter your educational attainment. It doesn't matter whether you live in the north or in the south or whether you live in America or Asia or South America or somewhere else in the world. Every single one of us is tempted at one time or another, and really we're tempted often in this life. It happens to everybody. And too often we rationalize about temptation and we give in. Billy was a young man who needed to lose weight. And he decided one day that he's going to go on a pretty drastic diet. So he cuts out almost all of his sugar, cuts back about half of his calories, and the first 30 days, he does really well. Loses 30 pounds in 30 days. But on day 31, it's a different story. Day 31, he comes into the office, and he's got a box 
with a dozen donuts. He sits down and he starts eating them. One of his friends looks at him and says, Billy, what are you doing? I thought you were on a diet. And Billy said, well, I am, but I believe God wants me to have these donuts today. And his friend said, why do you think that, Billy? And Billy said, well, this morning when I got up, I was craving donuts. And so I began to pray. I said, Lord, if there is a parking space available in front of the donut shop, then please, Lord, let that happen and let me get a dozen donuts. Sure enough, the eighth time around the block, there was a parking space. <laughs> Sometimes we rationalize about our temptations and we give in. Today we're going to talk about temptation because everybody is tempted. But here's the good news. Just because you're tempted doesn't mean you have to give in to it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says there is no temptation that's taken here, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. But sometimes we foolishly put ourselves into the middle of temptation. If you have a problem with drinking, don't keep beer in your refrigerator. If you tend to get into trouble when you hang out with certain people, don't hang out with those people. This ledge that I'm standing on here off the stage is two, maybe two and a half feet. But let's say it was 200 feet. How many of you think I'd be standing like this with my toes off the edge of this ledge? There is absolutely no way. How many of you think I would walk on this board of this ledge like it's a tightrope? There's absolutely no way that I would do that. Why? Because that's a 200-foot drop-off. No way. But since it's a couple of feet or so, not a big problem. Too often, we treat temptation like that. Not a big deal if we gossip about our neighbor. Not a big deal if we say a few curse words. Not a big deal if we cheat some people out of some money. It's not that big of a deal. But too often... We treat temptation, we treat sin like it's not that big of a deal and we end up falling in. I know it's only two and a half feet, but I'm not going to jump in right, right now, okay? But that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that we live our lives like we're walking on eggshells. I'm afraid to make a decision here. I'm afraid to make a move there. I'm afraid to do something over there because I'm afraid I might make a mistake, no, we don't live our lives that way. We don't want to be like the man who had one talent and he buried it because he was afraid that he might blow it. No, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1, 7, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power. Say the word power with me. Power and love and a sound mind. 2 Corinthians three seventeen says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That's not license to sin, but that's liberty to serve. God is calling us to live lives of liberty, to serve Him, to honor Him, to please Him with our lives. Now, I love the Amish. I think they're great people. But I think the Amish have it wrong. You see, they have isolated themselves from the world. And so they don't have a lot of impact in the world. But God has called us not to isolate ourselves from the world, but to be salt and to be light in the world. Anybody here, either in person or online, like popcorn? Yeah, a lot of you. Some of you probably eating some right now while you're watching online. <laughs> If you're like me, I love popcorn, but I don't like popcorn very much without any salt. I like a little salt on my popcorn. But let's suppose I have a bowl full of popcorn, and I can eat a large one. And I've got a salt shaker, but I never get the salt out of the shaker and pour it on the popcorn. It really doesn't do me any good, does it? Because in order to 
have an impact on the taste and the flavor of that popcorn. The salt has to come in contact with it. So it is with us and the world. If we're going to have an impact on the world, we have to come in contact with the world. Jesus said, you're the salt. Say the word salt with me. Salt of the earth. And you're the light of the world. God has called us to come in contact with the world, influence in the world with the love and the truth of Jesus Christ, and be the light of the world, to let Jesus Christ's light shine, Jesus said, so others may see his good deeds and praise our Father who is in heaven. One of my biggest goals in 2021 for us as a church is that we might be salt and that we might be light in our community. Then we might find ways as individuals, as families, and as a church family to impact our community by serving it and by reaching out to it with the love and the truth of Jesus Christ. And you'll hear a lot more about that in the weeks and months ahead. Sometimes following God may even lead you into a place of temptation. It might be at work. It could be at school. It might be on a football team or a cheerleading squad or marching in the band. It could be in the Rotary Club, in the Lions Club, in the Hospital Auxiliary. But if you're out there in the world, you're going to rub shoulders with people who likely do not know Jesus Christ and do not follow the ways of the Lord. But that's okay because we're surrounded by a world that is desperately in need of Jesus Christ. And our goal is not total isolation. Our goal is God-infused, Holy Spirit-empowered penetration. Here in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is actually being led by God into the place of temptation. But the chapter, interestingly enough, begins like this. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. If you want to handle temptation correctly, you need God's power to infuse you, to guide you, to give you his ability to walk with him in every circumstance of life. Jesus was completely God, but he was also totally man. He knew what it was like to be hungry. He got thirsty. He sweated. He got tired. He had many of the same challenges that you have. He had the same physical limitations that we have in this world today. Jesus is God, but while he was on this earth, he limited himself to be in one place at one time. Verse 1 says, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. James 1.3 reminds us that God is never the source of temptation. But he often allows it and he can use it for his own purposes. The idea here in verse 2 is that the temptation was ongoing during these 40 days. But here in Luke chapter 4, we see the culmination of it. Here the temptation reach, reaches its greatest pull. Satan sees this as his opportunity. Luke tells us that Jesus ate nothing for 40 days, so he was hungry. How many of you have ever gone 40 days without food? How about four days without food? How about 40 minutes without food? How about 40 seconds without food? Some of you eating food right now, either in person or online. It's hard to go without food. Jesus went 40 days without any food, so he's hungry. Verse 3 says, the devil then comes to him and says, if you are the Son of God. The idea here is, since you are the Son of God, Jesus, the devil knows who Jesus is. The Bible tells us that the demons believe and tremble. The devil continues, since you are the Son of God, Jesus, command this stone to become bread. The greatest temptation for Jesus here probably doesn't come from hunger, although the hunger was real. The greatest temptation may have come from the opportunity for Jesus to show the world his power or to use God's power for his own selfish means. People still do that today. 
pastors preach sermons and they go pretty well. People tell them that sermon was amazing. Or pastors build churches by God's grace along with the help of God's people and they grow from being small churches to mega churches. So people say, Pastor, you're amazing. It's not just pastors, it can be anybody. You can be a coach and your team begins to do well. Maybe win the conference championship, maybe go to state. And people say, hey, you're amazing. Maybe you're a business leader and you build a business from the ground up and it becomes a multi-million dollar operation. And people say, wow, you're an amazing leader. You can be a school teacher and everybody thinks, well, you're the best teacher in the school. You can do all kinds of things. You can be in the military and you get promoted to general. And you think, man, aren't I great? Listen, if you're great... It's only because God gave you the ability to become great, even if you're lost. Who gave you the ability to get out of bed in the morning? Who gave you the ability to think? Who gave you the ability to work? Who gave you the ability to do anything? The common grace of God. And if you're a Christian, all that we do, if it's going to last in eternity, must be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, it's wheat. It's not wheat, it's chaff to be burned up in the fire. Here in verse 4, Jesus answers the devil with scripture. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus is not saying that bread is bad. It's not bad to have food or clothing or furniture or cars or other necessities of life. It's not wrong to have stuff. The problem is when the stuff has you. It's not bad to have a successful career But when you start believing your own press, or you get too busy, or too important for other people, then you're falling into temptation. Go to verse 5. And the devil took him up and showed him, showed Jesus, all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to him, to you I will give this authority and their glory for It has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours, Jesus. There's a fair amount of debate about whether the devil could actually have the ability to give Jesus the world. After all, God is the God of the universe. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. God can be everywhere at the same time. The devil is none of those things. At the same time, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, that Satan is the God of this world. In John 12, 31, Jesus said Satan is the ruler of this world. How do you put that together? I think most of us would agree that Satan, the devil, is a major influencer in this world. He's influencing culture. He's influencing movies and music and media and politics. He's influencing people to be filled with hatred and lust and selfishness and grudges and greed. Is he not? As Christians, we're going in the opposite direction from the world. How many of you have ever been in a canoe? Probably many of you have. Have you ever been in a canoe and you're floating downstream And you decide, I want to turn around. I want to go back upstream. It's very difficult to do, is it not? Well, as Christians, when we follow Jesus Christ, we're going against the stream of the world. The stream of the world wants to pull us back into sin, wants to pull us back into selfishness, wants to pull us back into greed and unkindness and and lust and impurity and so many other things. But God wants to empower us to follow him even though that is going against the pull of this world. The devil's behind a lot of influencers in our world. He isn't just doing it out there in space. The Bible says the devil is at work in people who are living in disobedience. If you're not careful, he can even use you. The devil can even influence Christian families and churches and staff meetings and church business meetings. 
How many of you have ever been in a church business meeting when it looked like the devil was more in control than Jesus? <laughs> probably all of us. It's even happened at Northside probably a time or two since I've been here and before. As Christians, when you allow sin in your life, you're giving the devil a free pass to work in and through your life. But here's the good news. You don't have to be defeated by the devil. Romans 8.37 says, You're more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ your Lord. 1 John 4.4 4 says, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. 1 John 5.4 says, Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Ephesians 6 says, Finally be strong in the Lord. And the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against all the schemes, all the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and powers and forces in an unseen world. Therefore, take up the full armor of God. Put on the shield of faith. Take up the breastplate of righteousness. Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Put on the helmet of salvation. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And if you do that, you can live in victory. You can live in power for the glory of God, for the honor of Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1, 3 says, God's divine power has given you everything that you need for life and godliness, everything that you need to follow Jesus, everything that you need to live in God's power, in victory, in this world. Amen? James 4, 7 and 8 says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. A senior adult couple was driving down the Dixie Highway one day. They came up to a stoplight, and they stopped behind another couple sitting in an old pickup truck. And the couple in front of them in that pickup truck were sitting right next to each other on that bench seat. You couldn't have slid a New Testament between them. And this senior adult lady looks at her husband and says, Honey, you remember when we used to sit together like that? Husband doesn't say anything. He's got his hands on ten and two. She looks at him again and says, Honey, do you remember when we used to sit together like that? He doesn't answer again. Finally, she says, Honey, you see that couple up there sitting so close together? Do you remember when we used to sit like that? Husband still got her hands on, his hands on ten and two and said, I didn't move. Listen, if you're not as close to Jesus Christ as you want to be, it's not his fault. He didn't move. He's calling you to draw near to him. And he says, if you'll draw near to him, he will draw near to you. Our God wants you to be close with him, to walk in intimate fellowship with him. God has allowed Satan to have tremendous influence in this world for now. One of these days when Jesus returns, the situation is going to be entirely different. One of these days, God's going to lock Satan in hell and throw away the key. But that time hasn't come yet. First, there had to be a rejection of Jesus Christ. There had to be a mocking. There had to be a crown of thorns thrust on his head. He had to be nailed to a cross for your sins and mine. Satan was offering Jesus a shortcut. Jesus if you just bow down to me, you can skip all of that. And you can have everything that you want. Go to verse 8. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Here's the question. Who are you serving? Are you serving yourself? Are you serving sin? Are you serving Satan? Or are you serving God. We find temptation number three, starting in verse nine. And he took Jesus to Jerusalem and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, 
Throw yourself down from here. For it's written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. What might be most interesting about this temptation is the devil was using scripture in order to tempt Jesus Christ. Satan will sometimes twist the Bible in order to say what he, we want it to say, in order to say what he wants it to say. We can twist the Bible around ourselves as well. When you study the Bible, remember to look at the context. And remember to look at the scripture that you're reading in comparison to other scriptures in the Bible. Don't be like the guy who is looking for wisdom and he grabs his Bible like this. He looks up in the sky and he opens up the word and says, okay, I need to know what to do. He looked down at the Bible as he put his finger on a verse and said, oh, it says Judas went out and hung himself. I thought, well, that's not a very good idea. So he searches over another place in the Bible, doesn't look at anything in the scripture, just pulls over there, looking still up into the sky, puts his finger down on another verse, looks down and reads it. It says, you go and do likewise. I thought, well, that ain't very good. So he looks back up to the sky, looking for wisdom, wanting to know what God wants him to do, points down to another verse of scripture and says, what you do, do quickly. Not very good advice, is it? Too often, we look at Scripture not in the context of where it was written and who it was written to, not in the context of other Scriptures, but we just look for answers that kind of randomly, but God wants us to search the Scriptures, to know what they say, and to apply that to our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. And be careful about your motives when you're looking at Scripture as well. All three times, Jesus uses Scripture to answer the devil. Scripture is such an important tool in dealing with our enemy, the devil. David said, thy word have I hidden in my heart, that I may not sin against God. Jesus, the very Son of God, God in human flesh, used Scripture to defeat the devil, and so should we. Go to verse 12. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. The temptation here was to test God. Okay, if you're really God, Jesus, throw yourself down off the pinnacle of the temple. God's going to send his angels. They're going to catch you. You're not going to die. And Jesus said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Don't put him to the test. You're not doing that. Verse 13. And when the devil had ended every temptation... He departed from Jesus until an opportune time. The devil was through for a little while, but he will return. I believe the greatest temptation for Jesus was in the garden. When Jesus was about to face the cross the night before his crucifixion, he knew that the cross would involve terrible agony and physical pain. I think he also knew that the physical pain was not going to be the worst part of it. I believe that Jesus knew that bearing the sin of the entire world would be even more difficult, more agonizing than the physical pain that he would bear. I believe that Jesus also knew that while he was on the cross, that he could even face isolation, separation from God the Father. They had never been isolated from each other, never been separated from each other from eternity past up until that time. When Jesus would hang on the cross, at one point he's in such agony as the Father, who is too holy to look on sin, likely turns his back to not look at Jesus who became sin for us. And Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knew the agony was coming. And likely his greatest temptation was not 
to go to the cross. But thank God he did. Had it not been for a hill called Mount Calvary, had it not been for the old rugged cross, had it not been for a man named Jesus, then forever my soul, your soul, would be lost. The devil's still at work in our world. Have you noticed? It's not getting better. There are so many issues. There's so many struggles. There's so many problems. There's so many needs. There's so much division. There's so much angst. There's so much greed and lust and impurity. So much calling what is sin good. Calling what is wrong right. So much of our world, so much of our nation is headed down a path of disobedience toward God, even promoting it in our world. But here's the good news. You don't have to live in defeat. You can live in the power of God. You can live by the grace of and by the knowledge, and by the love, and by the power, and by the truth of God's Holy Spirit, you can walk in God's Word. You can live as more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ your Lord. Because greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world. And if God is for you, it doesn't matter who is against you. And you're serving the God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, and measurably more than all you can ask or even think or imagine. You're serving than God is in control. Listen, the president is not in control. The president elect is out of control. The governor's not in control. The Senate's not in control. I'm not in control. You're not in control. The Democrats are not in control. The Republicans are not in control. The coronavirus is not in control. Jesus Christ is still on the throne. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and he is not done working in this world yet. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Type it on your Facebook feed. Amen. Amen. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Type it on your Facebook feed. God is in control. He's in charge. I'm not in charge. Thank God I'm not in charge. You're not in charge. Your husband's not in charge. Your wife's not in charge. The kids are not in charge. The government's not in charge. God is in charge. And he ain't done yet. He's still at work in his throne. Philippians 1, 6 says, He who started a good work in you is faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And I'm glad I'm on his team. How about you? I'm looking forward to what God's going to do in 2021. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. That doesn't mean there won't be problems. There won't be issues. There won't be struggles. There won't be hardships. I'm not saying follow Jesus and you'll be wealthy. <laughs> The Bible doesn't say follow Jesus and you live to be a hundred and never have a headache or a heartache. The Bible doesn't say follow Jesus and life will be easy. No, the Bible says follow Jesus and he'll give you power for living. Moment by moment and day by day, he won't leave you, he won't fail you, he won't forsake you. He won't abandon you. He's still on the throne. But here's the question. Is he on the throne of your life? If not, do you want him to be? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your grace, your mercy. Thank you for your love, your compassion. Father, thank you that we don't have to live in defeat. We can live by the power of God. Listen, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, everything starts here. Give your life to Jesus Christ. If you want to know more about what that means, shoot me a text at 270-300-3078. Or stop by my office or shoot me an email. But let us know how we can help you. Father, work in our lives 
hear our prayer. We pray these things in Jesus' name. As we stand and sing together, you say yes to Jesus Christ. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day and there sins away, wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away, and then the I the vile as he wash all my sins away. Hi, this is Pastor Kevin. Thank you so very much for joining us through our online campus in worship today. It's an honor, it's a privilege to have you with us. And we are especially glad to have you if you're a guest today. If you are a guest and you'd like to know a little bit more about Northside, or you have a prayer request, or you want to know more about ways to get involved, activities that we offer, I would love to hear from you. Shoot me a text at 270-300-3078. Before we go, may I pray for you? Father, thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love, and your compassion. Thank you for the privilege of knowing you, and thank you for all of those who are watching online today. Bless them and give us a great day. Empower us by your Holy Spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you. Have a great day.